For the rest of us, if you continue to uh, look with me in Romans chapter 3, we're in verses 21 through 26 this morning. Romans 3, 21 through 26. You know, David uh, writes these words. I just found these things just kind of rolling through my heart and mind as we're singing that last song. Let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I'll praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. Forgives all my sins, heals all my diseases, redeems me from death, crowns me with love and tender mercies, fills my life with good things. You say amen to that? Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let all that is within me bless his holy name. Pray with me. Father, thank you this morning again. Where would we be without you? The answer is lost. But God, we're not without you. You came. You revealed yourself. You've revealed your truth. You've sent your son, Christ. There is a Savior. We have a Savior. Lord, again, we say thank you. We ask God that you would speak Christ to us through your word this morning. Lord, thank you too that we have the joy of lifting each other. And Father, I just want to remember to pray as well this morning. Thank you for being with Gary as he overcomes some cold and some things there. And for Jody this morning, God, just struggling, would you help her and be very present with her this morning as well. And we thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. We've been slowly working our way through Romans chapter 3. Have you felt a little bit of the, of the weight of that? I mean, Romans chapter 3 and prior to that, in fact, all the way back to chapter 1 and verse 18, we've been feeling the weight of our sinfulness. You know what compound interest is. It just continues to accrue day by day by day. Uh, perhaps the Holy Spirit is being offering to you and I something called compound conviction. Because we recognize more and more our sin. And when the scales of justice register that sin, it just weighs heavy. And the sin increases just more and more. Romans 3 all the way up to verse 20, from Romans 1.18 through Romans 3.20, there's just this weight of what it means when it says, We are so sinful. I mean, as a humanity, as a human beings, we suppress truth. We rebel against God. We go our own way. We do all those kinds of things. And it it weighs. And as our creator, the one who judges, looks at us and the scale is tipped, there's nothing you and I could change that picture. I have nothing to put on the other end of that scale. I have nothing to change What's waiting? And the more we turn from God, the more we go in the other direction, the deeper we recognize our sin to be. Don't you love going to the dentist? Some of us, you know, I'm sorry, I gotta give you this quick aside. The dentist that I had growing up, his name, literally this was his name, Dr. Payne. It was hard for a kid to get excited about going to see Dr. Payne. Dr. Payne didn't look like this one, but uh, let me tell you that Dr. Payne was a pain. Why? Because he took that magnifying glass with the lights and everything else, and he's shining it, and he's picking things out, and he's going, "Uh uh-huh, mm-hmm, cavity forming over here, got to deal with that, got a hole forming. And, And it doesn't feel good to be under that examination, does it? And sometimes the results lead to that, you know, got to fill that cavity. That doesn't feel that great either. All right, well, that's one kind of examination. But the point is that, that Paul, in God's word here, he's taking the word of God, he's shining the light and revealing the depth of our depravity and sinfulness. Some of us also have the experience of going to a dermatologist. And when you go to see a dermatologist, they also have uh, something that's there to help uh, examine what that mole is and what might it be and do we need to pay attention to that? Is there something we have to do with that? Not every mole is cancer, but some are. 
And, you know, as you walk through these verses in Scripture, you're coming away and perhaps, again, you're just feeling the weight of that. And last week, as you and I were reminded, we we're reminded very clearly that, uh, you know, we're kind of like the cowboys and the bikers thing going on in Cody there, that one particular rodeo, where everybody's trying to ride the bull and nobody makes it. Everybody gets bucked off. Because nobody, no one, not even one, is righteous as God is righteous. And God's word just paints this picture for us. And then we get to Romans 3 and verse 21. And I want you to notice with me those first words. Verse 20 says, 21, but now. That word but is, is dividing line. It's, it's saying we're getting on the other side of this. It's, it's like walking a ridge line in the mountains. And you've been climbing and you're here and you're looking down. Wow, wow, wow. And then you get to the other side. But now. Verse 21 represents the start of leaning into how is it possible for us to gain a right standing with God? How is that even possible? I've referred in the last number of weeks to the Supreme Court of the United States, highest court in the land. And, and it's important to us right now. In this election cycle, there's all kinds of questions being raised that relate to the elections and so forth and who can be on the ballot and all those kinds of things. I understand that. But it, it represents the highest court in the land. And so these justices that uh, are Supreme Court justices, when they register uh, a decision and they render a verdict, there is no more appeal. That's it. That's the last line. And so what they say becomes law and we follow by it. But here's a question. Who can bring a case in front of the Supreme Court in the United States? Who has the right and privilege to do that? Just because you were elected to office doesn't mean you can stand before the Supreme Court. In fact, you can't. Just because you have Hollywood A-list celebrity status doesn't mean you have the right to stand in front of the Supreme Court and argue the case. Just because you're an influencer on social media and have millions of followers doesn't give you the permission to stand in front of the Supreme Court and argue the case. You must be an attorney in order to stand before the Supreme Court justices and argue a case. An attorney in good standing with the court. Any attorney can do that if they have good standing before the court. Now that's how the law of our land works. And you can go to the highest court in the land and argue a case if you're an attorney in good standing. But how do you gain that good standing? Well, by making sure you're a good citizen and you're following what the laws of the land say. And only then can you stand in front of that Supreme Court. Which is what makes Romans chapter 3 such a powerful portion of Scripture. Because as you and I come to it, the man who's making the case about the depravity of humanity, the sinfulness of mankind, this one who's building his case, the Apostle Paul, is a convicted felon. If you know his story... Philippians chapter 3 paints his resume out for us a little bit. Pure-blooded citizen of Israel, a part of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one, a member of the Pharisees, having achieved in religious circles legalistic righteousness. But he says, as to zeal, I also what? Persecuted the church. And so Paul has blood on his hands. He's responsible for the torture and the killing of Christians, Christ followers. And he acknowledges that and confesses that that's true of him. And so here he is, standing in front of the Supreme Court of Heaven, arguing the case of the need for righteousness. And here he is, raising his hand and saying, and I need one who can give me a right standing before you because, God, I have nothing to stand on. I don't have a leg to stand on in front of you. Because I am also one of those who is a sinner and unable to stand before a holy God. Until he had an encounter with Jesus, Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul was certain that if he just worked hard enough and was spiritual enough and religious enough, he could win God's favor and be okay with God on the day of judgment. But it was as he encountered Christ as his own sinfulness was exposed, kind of like that dentist or that dermatologist exposing something that needs to be exposed, 
Paul discovered that his righteousness was nothing, that the only thing that mattered was Jesus, the son of the living God who came and offered himself in our place. And he says this in Philippians 3, I took all that other stuff that I put so much effort into that I counted it as trash and I just counted it as loss. Philippians 3 says, compared to this thing of gaining Christ, being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but rather that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. It was Christ and Christ alone that rescued him, that saved him. We just said, God, you're our Savior. And I can't thank you enough. That Savior is Jesus, and there's only one Savior. We gain right standing with God through Christ. And this is what Paul begins to lay in front of us, this way of righteousness that's revealed, this righteousness, he says in verse 21, but now this righteousness from God is apart from the law. And yet it's been made known and to which the law and the prophets testify. Now that that language, you and I have heard this before, a righteousness from God that goes back to Romans 1, verse 16 and 17. Paul says that this is God's gospel. This is his good news. And and he's trying to get our attention. He's saying, take this hard right turn. Right here, right now. Because as much as there is sin, God has a way of giving us a right standing before him and dealing with that sin. And this is where Paul begins to move as we move into the rest of chapter 3 and beyond. Paul begins unfolding for us what it means. He says, listen, the first thing you need to understand, it's separate, this gospel. It's separate from the law itself. It's not something that takes place by keeping the law. No one, he said back in verse 20, no one's going to be declared righteous based on following the law. Why? Well, because we don't do it right. We mess up. We fall short. So no one's going to be declared righteous in that way. This righteousness then, this right standing with God, has to come in a different way. It won't come just by being religious. It won't come by just being spiritual. I mean, if it could come that way, we'd best all just become good Jewish people and just follow that law if that was possible. But Paul says, I've tried that, I've done that, I was part of the Pharisees that kept the 612 laws like no other and discovered in myself and all of us It's not enough because I'm a sinner. And yet there's a testimony in Moses on through the prophets about this righteousness from God. And so this righteousness from God, it's not disconnected from the law. The law, in fact, is a school teacher. It's it's teaching us, schooling us of what sin is and why we need a Savior. And that same portion of scripture, Moses through the prophets, testify that there's a pathway to have a right standing with God. It has been made known, perfect tense, has been and continues to be made known. So let me tell you what that way is. Let me tell you how it is that you can have a right standing with God. And it's tied to the books of Moses, the law through the prophets. For example, back in the book of Leviticus, we're told that there's a day of atonement. And in order to be right with God, the people of God had to gather at least this one time a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and, and there a sacrifice would be offered up and the high priest would go behind the curtain of the Most Holy and offer sacrifice. And a, a scapegoat would be brought along and the sins of the people would be confessed on the scapegoat and it would be taken off and, and led, led off into the wilderness and there your sins go, so to speak, and, and the blood cleanses and the blood restores relationship with God. This is all part of God's law. It's all there and it has to be done over and over and year after year after year. It has to be repeated. But the Torah and the prophets testify of one who will come, who changes everything. In Jeremiah chapter 31, in Ezekiel chapter 36, the Lord says, there is a new covenant that I will make with my people. And through that new covenant, that new promise, there's a way of righteousness that I'm going to open up. And oh, by the way, this requires one sacrifice once for all. And it's done. And so there's this righteousness that takes place, this transfer of righteousness that represents the way to us. Verse 22 of Romans 3, Paul says it this way, the righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This righteousness from God is available to you and I. Now, I don't know about you, but if you have health care, if you have social security, you've got these benefits, they're not yours until you tap into them. 
You got to know how to tap into them. And what Paul's telling us right here, right now, in clear, uncertain terms, is the way in which you tap into the righteousness from God is by going to Christ and place your trust in him. Take God at his word. The fact that Christ is the way, the only way. Romans 1.17, this righteousness from God is, is by faith, first to last, just as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. And so you have to exercise that faith. You put your entire weight in Christ and Christ alone. And, and this is the way of salvation. It's by faith alone. Belief alone. And so we, what that says to us is we add nothing to what God's already done. This righteousness from heaven, you and I have nothing to add to it. What we do is we tap into it and receive from the one who made it possible. So it starts with faith alone. Friends, faith works like this. It's like being aware that you're on a plane. I'm not going to say it was a Boeing. That's going to go down. And you've got a parachute. And faith says, we're going down. I have a way out. I'm putting on the parachute. And faith says, I'm going to get out of this plane that's going down. I'm putting my trust in the parachute. And so somewhat of a leap of faith, if you will. And what are you hoping really works? When you pull that ripcord... That there's a shoot in what you're wearing. And you land safely. Faith is believing Christ is that parachute. And the only parachute. But you got to put them on. And pull the ripcord. And know that he saves. Faith alone. In Christ alone. You see it matters. The object of our faith matters. Faith alone, Christ alone. Some of us have been enjoying this spring weather, but I can tell most of us are not ice fishermen. Because if you're an ice fisherman, like I saw some yesterday, they went out when it was still pretty cold out and they're drilling the holes in ice to catch fish, right? But they were exercising faith in the ice. Is that a good idea? Sometimes. If you know the ice is thick enough, or there isn't a natural spring, or it hasn't got warm enough that the ice has started to melt. Sometimes, just because you're sincere in your faith doesn't mean it's going to hold your weight. Ask the guy with the pickup truck that needs to get it towed out of the pond because it went through, right? Faith alone in Christ alone. He has to be worthy of our faith, of our belief, our trust, to do what it is he promises to do. But notice it's Christ alone. Faith is not about Jesus plus something. It's not about Jesus plus your best efforts. It's not about Jesus plus keeping all the rules or acting religious or Jesus and being spiritual. No, it's Christ and Christ alone. This righteousness from God comes to us by faith alone in Christ alone. The Christ. The Christ who says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14 and verse 6. Jesus' words. He's either telling the truth or he's a liar. You can't have it both ways. The way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, Gabriel talks to Mary and says, you're to name this son that will be born to you, Yeshua, Joshua, which means the Lord saves. Simeon, chapter 2, verse 30, is holding Jesus, this child at eight days old, says, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all people, Christ alone. You come to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter and John are giving testimony in front of the Jewish leaders and saying that there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Salvation, they said, is found in no one else. Christ alone. This way of righteousness, this way of escaping God's judgment, that which we deserve, is found by faith alone. 
in Christ alone. And it's so important we understand it's by grace alone. Grace in that it's God's gift. We don't deserve this. We haven't earned it. We can't say to God, just accept me the way I am because I think my good outweighs my bad. It doesn't. It doesn't work that way. This is God's grace to us. For Ephesians 2 verse 8, by grace, the undeserved kindness of God, you've been saved. God's going to show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in that kindness to us in Christ. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is that incredible gift. I read from Psalm 103 a few moments ago at the start of the message. Who forgives all my sins. Heals my disease. Who gives me a crown. Allows me to be with him for all of eternity. This is all by grace. Faith alone. Christ alone. Grace alone. This is the way of righteousness. And it's God's free gift to us. Here's a good teaching technique. Tell them what you say, want to say, tell it to them, and then tell them what you said. All right? Back and forth. Verse 23, notice what Paul does? He goes right back. He's talking about grace. He's talking about the things God's done, the way of righteousness. Verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you didn't get it yet, he says it again. Everyone comes up short. Everyone is a sinner. Ecclesiastes 7.20, there's not one, not one who is righteous amongst us. And the first step towards this way of salvation and receiving this righteousness from heaven and from God is acknowledging that, admitting that, and saying, God, you're right. You're telling me just the way it is, and this is who I am. All have sinned. That's me. Fallen short of the glory of God, his expectations, his standards. No one gets a pass on that. We're missing out on that, on that glory. All of sin falls short. And we need God's intervention. That's verse 24. We are justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What we could never do, God did for us. This is why it's talking about a righteousness from heaven, that which God did for us. He, he made an intervention for us. He determined that he would rescue and restore his fallen creation. He would reunite us to, us, uh, him, uh, us to himself, and he did so through sending his son. And as you read in the scriptures, Jesus wasn't forced to do what he did. He volunteered. Freely I lay my life down. Freely I take it up again. I choose. You, me, God's grace, this incredible gift of his son for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We're told that God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood, Romans 3 and verse 25. Here's how the New Living Translation takes those verses. It says this, God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Christ's atoning sacrifice is the price that's been paid for our justification and redemption. This is love, the scripture says in 1 John. Not that we loved him, but rather he loved us and sent his son, what? As an atoning sacrifice. Where sin increased. Grace increased even more. What I could never do, he did. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The blood of God. Shed for us. First Peter 1 9 talks about the price, his precious blood. Notice that it's red in color. Life for life, blood for blood. This is the way of righteousness. And this free gift was done for you and I. That's done. There's nothing more to be done. That happened on the cross. That substitute atonement took place on the cross. That great exchange has been made. Jesus bore our judgment on the cross so that we might be righteous. And so he took <clears throat> our sin on himself and took his righteousness and transferred it to us. And this is how we become righteous and gain right standing. 
before God. The fact that he atoned for our sin, that is, he covered our sin. His blood washed away our sins in that way. This is called redemption, where we've been purchased, we've been uh, ransomed, we've been set free from that sin. And justification is this idea of being declared not guilty, fully acceptable to God, sins erased. How is it even possible? Because the righteous one, Jesus, transferred his righteousness to you and I and took our sin on himself and erased it forever. That's God's justice. This is what God has done for us This is justification. This is the righteousness from heaven. Look with me at verse 25 and following Romans 3. It tells us again, this is God demonstrating justice. The scales of justice tipped in our favor. How is it possible? Jesus. How do you and I enter into that? Putting our faith in Jesus and him alone. This righteousness from heaven, it it demonstrates the righteousness of God. God is righteous. He demands righteousness. And in Christ, he provides that righteousness. Verse 25, God did this to demonstrate his justice. In his forbearance, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time. So as to be the one who is just and justifies those who have faith. This demonstrates God's restraint, his patience, his kindness and grace to us in that. He didn't unleash immediate judgment and, and it was his right to do so, but he held it back. The scripture says he restrained it. Isaiah 48, verse 8. For my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you so as not to cut you off. Friends, that's Old Testament. Romans 3 is New Testament. God says, what I did then, I'm doing now. And this righteousness from heaven is freely extended to us. And rather than the judgment that we deserve, God says, I'm holding it back. This is my patience. And do you understand that in his patience, in his kindness, his mercy, his grace, because he's held it back and Christ has not yet returned, that means salvation to those who have not yet believed. And trust it. That time is coming. Christ will return. But at this time, God is patient. First, uh, Second Peter 3 talks about his patience. He doesn't want any to perish. Everyone to come to repentance. So his restraint means salvation to those who are still to respond. Justice at work. But notice that his justice is fulfilled. It satisfies God's heart. Sin must be punished. If God doesn't punish sin, he's not God. He's not righteous. He's not just. He's not good. He's not merciful if if he doesn't deal with sin. He deals with it fully, completely. And Christ, in making this incredible exchange, our atoning sacrifice became, here's a word, you'll want to hang on to this one, Our propitiation. Propitiation. It has this idea of the heart of God is satisfied with the sacrifice that's been made. Fully accepted. When Jesus spoke the words, it is finished on the cross, paid in full. Our propitiation, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, made that exchange. And Paul is arguing that point to say, that's done, it's it's over, it's finished, and God's heart is satisfied. Justice has been fully done. Christ bore it all, so you and I would bear none of it. Can you understand the good news that that represents to you and I? The gospel of God. Jesus did that for us while we were still sinners. And Christ invites us now to respond and believe and trust and put all of it there. Donald Barnhouse has written a series of commentaries, one of which deals with Romans. As I was reading it this week, he 
He says, and I'm going to give you my paraphrase, okay? How, how do you describe this righteousness from God this way? The, the Bible tells God's plan to send his son to save us. To clean us up by doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. Eliminating our sin through Christ's death on the cross. Justifying the ungodly, those who believe in Jesus, and then brings us safely home to heaven without messing up heaven with sin and without ruining his own reputation by associating with sinners. This is the righteousness of God. Justice complete. Sin atoned for. The holiness of God on display. The glory of his righteousness. The glory of his salvation to all who believe. Friends, our worship team is going to come up and lead us in a closing song. And I just have to ask the question again this morning. What is God speaking to your heart? On what side of that scale are you? Are you still on the side of the scale where there's sin but no Savior? No belief. No trust. No faith. Are you still trying to do it on your own? Or is the Spirit of God actually breaking through today and saying, no, Jesus did it all. Paid the price. This is the glorious good news. His kindness, his grace, his mercy to us. And he's simply waiting for you and I to say, oh Lord, I just want to give all of who I am back to you because you've given everything to me. I just give my life fully to you. As our worship team leads in this closing song, is called Come to the Altar. Your altar can be right where you are. You don't have to get up and move somewhere per se, but it can be right where you are. And even as we sing these words, can you hear Jesus calling? And is he inviting you to put your faith in him perhaps for the very first time and saying, Lord, I need you to be my Savior. And you can pray that right where you are. We're gonna, I'm going to lead a prayer at the end of that song. But make this your time of responding to the Lord. He's showing us, yes, our tremendous need for the righteousness from heaven because we are sinners. And he's shown us the way of righteousness. And it comes by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. May we hear, may we respond to the God who saves. Worship team.